All right. Good afternoon. Finally said it. Normally I say good morning because I teach eight o'clocks all week. <laughs> so it's really a struggle to say good afternoon. But here we are after lunch. And this is part two of the tactics for engaging in difficult conversations. And this is going to be really the, um, the bulk of our, our training and how to have conversations with folks that, that disagree with us or, or to learn more about opposing points of view. We're going to continue using these two resources, Greg Kokel and Peter Bogosian's books, Tactics and How to Have a Possible Conversations. And today we're going to focus really on the, the last three things in Peter Bogosian's book. Uh, the, he has seven fundamentals for good conversations and, and the last three are shoot the messenger, uh, intentions, and walk away. So we're going to unpack what those things mean. And then we're going to give you some tips and uh, ways to recognize good arguments and ways to recognize bad arguments, bad meaning ineffective, and, and ways to defend when somebody sort of puts you on the defensive. You know, if you feel emotions rising and so on, not just in your uh, conversation partner, but in yourself, how can you check that? And how can you uh, maneuver to keep the emotions down and keep the information going, okay? And so these are barriers to good conversations. One of the barriers to good conversations is delivering messages. Like you have a message to deliver and you're gonna tell the person without really listening to them, you're just gonna to deliver your message to them. Another one is assuming their, uh, their intentions. And we'll discuss what that means. And then going too far. You know, you, you know that happens, right? You're like, oh, I went too far. Or, oh, no, they're going too far and really pushing me. So we'll discuss what that is. And then defensiveness and fear. We'll, we'll talk about what fear does to us when we're in a conversation or even before we get into a conversation. So those are some things that are uh, barriers to good conversation. And then today we're going to talk about logic as well. So we'll look at some logical principles and what makes a good argument. And then we'll look at some uh, logical fallacies and things that may look sound on their face, but there's some problem with the way the argument is being carried out. And then more, probably most importantly, and this will be part of the writing exercise this week, and that is the um, different kinds of biases that we have. And so there's a, a nice little page called Your Bias Is, you know, and so you can look at that and kind of see which, which type of bias you might be um, uh, wrestling with. And it'll hopefully open your eyes to those things that you accept without any kind of scrutiny. Because we all have biases. We all come with a set of experiences and it's very easy to just accept those things that confirm our own experiences. And so it's nice to have a spotlight shine on those occasionally. So, this is that principle uh, from Peter Bogosian's book where he says, shoot the messenger. And he's not talking about the person who's delivering a message to you, okay? <laughs> he says that, and he's, his book is nice because he has a lot of social science research in there and he's cited his sources. And he's uh, citing this source, he says, the research literature on effective conversation shows that delivering messages doesn't work. It's not very persuasive. Uh, messengers don't speak across political and moral divides. You know, that takes much more handshaking, doesn't it? If you've got a political divide between us, me just delivering my message is really not going to be persuasive to you. So delivering messages just really doesn't bridge that divide. What does bridge that divide? If delivering a message doesn't, you know, if you're talking to someone who votes differently than you or has a different set of experiences than you, what could bridge that divide? Common ground. And common ground requires questions, like we talked about last time. Asking those good questions. And, and making of just a connection, you know. Common ground, a, a human connection. And, and you can't be fake about it. You've got to actually genuinely want to be friends with this person. That's the thing that's going to help bridge that divide. Just telling them what you believe um, and delivering that message is not going to go very far. Uh, it's going to be more of a one-way transaction. You're just delivering the information to them. Now there's one place where this does work, and that is when you're speaking to a group that already agrees with you, and they're just sharp, you're just sharpening their saw. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? You're, so you're delivering a message to someone who's already invested in what you have to say. And in that case, it, it does work. I mean, that's, that's part of what we do in education, especially in our major. Like my students finally make it to the last course in their degree, the forensic 
chemistry course and they're in there they're ready to hear about forensic chemistry I don't really have to bridge any divides so I can tell them just about everything I know about forensic chemistry and they can take it in um, in religious circles we call this preaching to the choir have you heard that phrase <laughs> okay and that's fine if you preach to the choir the choir understands what you're saying and they're willing to accept your points but when you're not preaching to the choir you're still delivering the same message it's probably not going to bridge that divide and they're probably not going to understand what you're saying or accept the message um, and so also Peter in his book he made sure he said by shoot the messenger I don't mean shooting somebody I mean shooting your own tendency to deliver messages to others okay uh, the second one that he lists that is a barrier to good conversation is assuming people's atten intentions okay and this is really where questions come in when, when, when you sort of think the other person already believes a certain way and then you're crafting your language that way you're assuming a lot and a lot of times those assumptions uh, are uh, off the mark and can really stop a good conversation in its tracks uh, he has a long dialogue with Socrates in, in his book and he's basically saying that at the end Socrates says people don't knowingly desire bad things okay and so if you think the other person you're talking with has uh, reprehensible beliefs um, assuming that they know they're reprehensible and that they want to be reprehensible is not fruitful <laughs> okay they probably have reasons for believing what they believe and ask questions about how they came to that conclusion you know go back to Colombo 1 and Colombo 2 and get more information because they probably don't knowingly believe something that would be seen as bad okay so assuming that their intentions are bad is a bad mistake um, for example, physicians used to treat patients with leeches, right? Because they thought disease was caused by too much blood. They just didn't have the information that we have now. Okay, they didn't know about pathogens. They didn't know about bacteria and viruses and so on. But they were dealing with the information that they had. That doesn't mean that they were right, but it means that they were doing the best that they could and their intentions weren't to cause people harm. Most people, and I would say we all have some impulse for goodness, it's sort of built into us. Um, and so lacking that comprehensive picture is what gets us off track. And if we have different experiences, then we come at the world differently. We have different points of view. And so that's why to build that bridge, we need to ask good questions and, and make that personal connection. And then the third one in, in the end of his uh, list is know when it's time to wrap it up, okay? So whenever, whenever either party is tired, just you're done. And we've discovered that in our family. You know, um, when the kids are tired, it doesn't do any good to try to tell them one more time you know, uh, that they forgot to take the trash out or, or to try to lecture them on any kind of main point, like too much TV or too much screen time or whatever. They're too tired. They're not going to hear it. Okay. Same thing with us. When we're too tired, it's probably not a good time to ask us to do other things. Um, so when people are tired, they're just not in the mood for it. Uh, but that's a great time to make personal connection time. You don't have to get any points across. Just connect with people. Okay. Putting pressure on someone to continue a conversation beyond their comfort level. It shuts down. They're listening. Makes them defensive. And I guess what uh, more importantly is is whenever you uh, are pushing it too far again you're going beyond persuasion and now it's sort of moving into a power trying to force them to continue when they're done and so just know when to wrap it up um, and then finally I added this one this really isn't in his in his book but I added this that that fear is a huge barrier to good conversations most of the time people don't even get into conversations that they think might be on the edge of disagreement because of fear. Has any of you experienced that and be willing to share? To say, hey, you know, I don't bother talking, you know, to people I disagree with. Does, it, does anybody identify with that? I mean, I do that sometimes too. With other professors, I'm thinking, and I may be assuming, it's like, well, I'm pretty sure that I don't agree with them and they don't agree with me. And so we'll keep it at the surface level, like with the weather, uh, grading, uh, classes, you know. Um, pretty safe topics. Why is that? Well, honestly, I, I'm a bit afraid. I can admit that. That I don't necessarily want to cause a rift between one of my colleagues and me. 
you know. Yet I'm missing out on a, on a potential friendship. There's so much I'm assuming that's probably incorrect. And even if we did disagree, I might learn a lot more about their perspective and about why they believe the way they believe. And if I use my good questions, I'm probably not going to upset them. You know, my behavior at least would, shouldn't upset them. Maybe my ideas will, but, but I think it's worth taking the risk. Uh, so some of the sor sources of fear in a difficult conversation are fear of being wrong. Fear of looking stupid. You know, a lot of times, uh, you know, you may know, a, you know, the surface amount of a topic, but you don't really want to get into it because you don't know very, you don't know it very deeply. And so you don't want to look dumb. You like bring something up and then they hit you with all these facts and, and you feel like you've got egg on your face. Okay. Uh, not being quick enough. You know, you've got somebody that's really vocal and good with words and you may not feel that way. And so you're worried about getting into a conversation with them because you think they're going to run away with it or run over you. This can happen, but uh, again, we'll give you a technique today for not being run over by a fast and smooth talker. <laughs> okay. And then just fear of being outmatched. You know, the person, you may think, oh, they're smarter than me, or they, they have more education than me, or they've you know, been in school longer and have more facts and so on. And so you may just be you know, reluctant to get into a good conversation with them. Are there any that I've missed? Look at that list, see if there's anything. These were just off the top of my head, so this isn't uh, anything I've done research on. It's just self-reflection. Okay. And then fear of losing friends or reputation. I had missed one. <laughs> Okay, let's say you've got a close friend and you know you disagree, you just don't want to go there. Instead of really having a conversation about your disagreements, uh, you just ignore it and, and don't go there. And so one way to reduce that fear, I call it reconnaissance. So getting to know more about the topics, getting to know more about logical reasoning, getting to know more about how to recognize a good argument, how to recognize a bad argument, if you kind of know how discourse is supposed to take place, then you've kind of done reconnaissance. You know where the high ground is. Do you know what reconnaissance is? It's like before a battle. You go and you look at the satellite maps. You find blueprints if you're in a building. You want to know as much about the field of battle as possible. And I don't really want to make uh, conversation sound too um, combative, but still, You've got to know the lay of the land. You've got to know what a good argument is versus a lame one. And so let's look a little bit at, at the basic logical reasoning. This is the lay of the land, and this would be the high ground in any discussion, would be the syllogism. Okay? It's a logical way of making a point. And so a syllogism presents a single logical inference in three parts. Now sometimes they're longer. The longer they get, the more difficult they are to defend. But the Three-part syllogism is probably the easiest to defend, or at least the easiest to state. So the major premise contains a term from the predicate of the conclusion. And so when you're building a syllogism, you have a point that you'd like to make. That's going to be your conclusion. And that predicate, subject predicate, the last part of that conclusion is going to be part of the major premise. The minor premise contains a term from the subject of the conclusion. So you have two parts of your conclusion, the subject and the predicate, and you're going to have two statements that have evidence in them or things that are in, in philosophical terms obvious to the clear thinker with right faculties. Okay? And so here's probably the, the most um, famous syllogism going back to, to um, you know, Socrates, Plato, and, and Aristotle. But when all of these premises are true and the syllogism is properly constructed, it produces an ironclad argument. Now most of the time people don't talk in syllogisms, but I'm saying that this is the highest spot on any battleground. You know, if you get to the point where you need to make an argument, like a legal argument, you're going to have a conclusion and you're going to support it with premises. And if the premises are true, 
then the conclusion must follow. If the person is rational, okay? They can still reject it and say, I agree that that supports the conclusion, I just don't buy it. But then they can't claim to be rational in terms of their approach to the argument. Okay. They need to decide which premise that they disagree with and they need to be able to argue against the premises. Because if the premises are true, then the conclusion follows. Okay. So here's the most famous syllogism in philosophy. All men are mortal, that's the major premise, and I've color-coded it, okay? Socrates is a man, and so therefore Socrates is mortal. Do you kind of see like A equals B, and, and uh, C equals A, therefore B equals A, or A equals B. So you can see this, and a lot of times they just went to symbolic logic and got away from words like Socrates and man and mortal, and just do, you know, a equals B, B equals C, therefore A equals C. And you can do, you can reduce these logical arguments to just statements like that. There's whole courses in logic, obviously. This is just, this, just scratching the surface. But now you can see the, the major premise has the word mortal in it, which is from the predicate of the conclusion. So if I were wanting to prove that Socrates was mortal and, and not a god, <laughs> okay, then I would say, here we go, Socrates is mortal. That's the conclusion that I want. Now, how am I going to support that? I'm going to support it by looking at the predicate, and I'm going to make a major premise and say, well, men are mortal. Okay. So that would be my major premise. And then I would look at a minor premise and say something about Socrates. I would say, Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is, is mortal. So that's how you build up the syllogism. My main point really isn't to teach you how to make three-part syllogisms, but just to show you that this is the sort of the highest level of, of logic that you would have in a conversation. Now, if you were talking in syllogisms and dealing with logic with somebody, the conversation would be very academic and probably less heated because you would be talking about the truth of the premises and so on. You would ask questions. What do you mean by mortal? What do you mean by man? What do you mean by Socrates? And those, again, are not emotionally laden questions. They're about the facts of the matter, and you're trying to establish whether the premises are true or not. Okay. So again, the major premise provides the predicate, the minor premise provides the subject, and if both premises are true, then the, the conclusion follows, which means it's true as well. So here's another one. Cats make good pets. Okay, that's the, the major premise. Dogs and cats are equally good as pets. Therefore, dogs make good pets. So the logical argument, and here's another term for you, the logical argument is valid, meaning if the premises are true, the conclusion follows. It has the correct structure of a valid argument. But valid doesn't mean true. Valid just means that it's constructed correctly. And if it's not constructed correctly, we say it has a mistake in form. So we would call that a formal fallacy. It's, it's fallacious because it's in the wrong form. Okay? Not formal as in proper or well-dressed. <laughs> okay? It's a mistake in form. And so if you didn't have a correct structure to your syllogism, then it would be a formal fallacy. Okay? This one is, is correct in its form, and so it's a valid argument. But notice how we make that mistake all the time. We say, well, he has a valid argument. That almost makes it sound like it's true, doesn't it? You can have a valid argument which is completely false if one of the premises is false. Okay, like the middle one. I disagree with this premise. I don't think dogs and cats are equally as good as pets. Okay, I'm not too strong on that. I, I kind of like cats better, but equal? I don't know if they're equal. Okay, and so we would argue about premise too if you were, you know, sitting around the coffee shop with me. Um, how many people uh, disagree with premise one? Any anti-cat people? <laughs> yeah, there's a few people that are kind of like, I'm not so sure about cats. And I could make arguments against cats, too. I mean, you know, I'm just not so happy about an animal pooping in my house, you know. But then again, with dogs, I don't like to have to walk an animal out there all the time in the rain and the cold and so on. It's, you can kind of tell I don't have a dog or a cat at the house. <laughs> <laughs> right. We don't have a fenced yard and anyway, I had pets as a kid, absolutely loved them, but we haven't had pets in a while. But the point is, if the premises are false, then the argument fails. It's still valid, 
but it's not true. If one of the premises is not true, then the argument's not true. And so you can have a, a low-key, non-emotional argument about the premises as to whether they're true or not. And how would you determine if something is true? So here's a good definition of truth. Okay, it's called the correspondence principle of truth. Okay, so I have it down. It's, truth is that which corresponds to reality. Okay, the old way of saying it, I think it was Plato, he said, if you say that it is, and it is, that's true. If you say that it isn't, and it isn't, that's true. So if it's not real, like it doesn't correspond to reality, that's not true. And if it does correspond to reality, it is true. So you got a husband and wife, they're walking down the sidewalk and a person walks up to them and says, I hear you're expecting. And one says yes, the other says no. Right? Which one of those answers corresponds to reality is the true answer. We don't say they're both right. Okay? <laughs> one may be uninformed. Okay? But the point is, whichever one corresponds to reality that's the true statement. Okay. Now, nothing in academia is without controversy. Okay. So some people would, would question this and they would say that you, know, you could scratch out reality and put personal narrative or something. So that gets into postmodernism and that's a whole other topic for discussion. But in a moderate realism, this would be our, our statement for truth, what is true. And so when we're talking about the the premises, we're trying to figure out which of those statements, or both, corresponds to reality. If cats, in reality, are good pets, then that first premise is true. And if cats and dogs are equally good as pets, okay, then that second premise is true. In, rea if they re in reality, they have pros and cons, but if they're equally good, then the second premise is true. Okay? And therefore, then the conclusion would follow. Okay? The dogs make good pets. Okay. Here's an example. This is one that's currently argued all the time and it goes back I guess the, to uh, ancient times. Moral obligations exist. Okay, that's premise one. God, also known as a moral lawgiver, is required for moral obligations. So that would be premise two. You see you've got a, the predic up there, existence, you've got uh, God, which is the subject of the conclusion, therefore God exists. So you could argue those premises. If moral obligations exist in reality, then the first premise is true. The second one a lot of people argue about, is God required for moral obligations? So the word obligation is important there, because am I obliged to you, or am I obliged to you, or nebulous society, or am I obliged to God for my morality? So there's some that would argue for that premise and some that would argue against that premise. And so this is known as the moral argument for God's existence. Okay. And again, it's a, a syllogism, a three-part syllogism. I've seen this thing expanded to three or four parts. Um, to kind of take a premise whenever it's challenged, they'll break a premise into two and they'll have more an obvious premise and then a less obvious premise. And so it helps the argument a little bit. And so this one is typically not written in just three, but I wanted to write it in terms of a three-statement syllogism. Here's another one. This is known as the problem of pain argument against God's existence. Unnecessary suffering exists. That's premise one. Premise two, a good God would prevent unnecessary suffering. And then the conclusion contains parts of the major and the minor premise. A good God does not exist. 
So if the first premise is true, unnecessary suffering exists, we have to understand what unnecessary means, what, uh, what suffering means, what existence means. So you could ask questions about all three of those words. A good God, what does good mean? What does God mean? Uh, would prevent, how do we know what a God would do? And unnecessary suffering is present in this premise as well. And so then you would work your way through those premises, but if those premises correspond to reality, then the conclusion follows. Okay. Yes? Um, thank you, Dr. Williams. Would anything change if you switched the first sentence with the second sentence, just in order? I don't think that there's anything particular about the order of the premises. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I'm not too sh sure, again, uh, the details on why it matters which one's the major premise, which one's the minor premise. premise. Uh, it's just by convention, I think, that the major premise has the predicate of the conclusion and the minor premise has the subject of the conclusion. Okay. And so I just wanted to show you some arguments that are out there in terms of the religion side of the course for and against God. These are, again, you can find YouTube videos galore on the moral argument uh, for and against. You can find a problem of pain arguments for and against, whole debates based upon these topics. And so this will give you the foundation for understanding what they're doing in the debate. They're discussing these premises because they know if the premises are true, the conclusion follows. And if either one of the premises is false, then the conclusion doesn't follow. Now, there may be a different type of argument to be made, but that particular syllogism fails if any of the premises are not true. And by true, we mean corresponds to reality. Now, this is a, a bit of a loaded word. How do we know reality? Right? If we're going to try to say this statement corresponds to reality, then we get into what's called epistemology, how we know things. And one way we know things is by observation. And that's the science part of the course. How do we know the moon orbits the earth? Okay. We take measurements and so on. How do we know the earth orbits the sun? We We've got different theories, we put those together, and which one takes account of the most facts? Okay. And so we say this model matches the data that we have the best. The data we have uh, in, a, in a realism philosophy, the data is something that we can look at objectively. Uh, the data doesn't change when you look at it or when I look at it. It's a third quantity, and we can both evaluate it. And the theories that go through the most data points, uh, we deem as a better theory. Any other comments? So thank you, Jeremiah. Okay, so that was the sort of the high ground of an argument. And so there are also logical fallacies. Now these are called informal fallacies. Not, not because we're sloppy necessarily, although some of these result from sloppiness. But remember a formal fallacy is that the argument was just constructed in the wrong form. So it wasn't put together right. So those would be formal fallacies. These are called Ill informal logical fallacies. Okay, so by arguing with these informal fallacies, then you're not making, uh, the argument may be valid, but the way you're stating your premises and so on are, are, are off. So you're making, uh, you, your argument is false because of these informal fallacies. And so we'll look at a bunch of funny examples here. Uh, there's some good websites that I found. This is, again, a site called Philosophy Terms. So I'm going to click on this. Let's hope Chrome cooperates with us. Patience is a virtue. <laughs> okay. Get the spinny wheel. Oh, it's still going. Let's see. All right. And so this again, if you get I'll put these PowerPoint slides up on the on the Blackboard site and you can go through and you can see these different links. And you've got all of these different logical fallacies here, different types. It's a great site. It, it may look long, but believe me, it's not very long. A lot of the other sites I use are like the 
uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and those, if you were to print them out, would be 20 or 30 pages. So uh, this is short <laughs> and concise. So let's look at some of the logical fallacies. There are too many to list, but we make lists anyway, as you can see. And so this is one of my favorite sites as well. Uh, it's your logical fallacy is all one word dot com. Okay. And they've got all of these here, these little little icons they've put with the different logical fallacies. And it's a really fun site. This is more concise than the other. They even have a game. You can print off the cards, print them on cardstock like I've got here, and cut off, cut out the cards, and it's got rules and so on. It's it's pretty funny. So you can watch television or commercials, and as soon as a logical fallacy is uh, shown, the first one to hold up their card, you know, wins. Of course, them trying, you know, they turned it into a drinking game, but. Uh, that's not cool. <laughs> yeah. So, so here it is. Uh, and so you've got these. These are all little icons and so on. And you can go around, um, like you've heard of ad hominem. So let's talk about the ad hominem attack. Um, yeah. So a lot of these, again, they go back uh, to ancient days in philosophy when we wrote everything in Latin. And so let's practice in your notes, okay, um, or in your thinking, <laughs> right. Write down, but it, go ahead and get a piece of paper out and write down an ad, an example of an ad hominem fallacy. Now, what is an ad hominem fallacy? It's uh, you're speaking uh, what they call ad hominem is Latin for against the man. Okay, and so let me show you an example from our our web page. So this is kind of nice. It gives us a, a rundown. So you've probably seen this, certainly on the news, when we're talking about the, the latest uh, news and they they ask a, a senator or a congressperson or somebody about their opponent, do they, do they go against the opponent's arguments? What do they do? They, they attack the person and that's what this is. That's an ad hominem attack. So you know what you've seen you know, in your everyday life and go ahead and write down an example. So ad hominem attack, go ahead and take two minutes and write down an example of an ad hominem attack that, that you remember seeing um, either in the news or even in your, in your circle of friends. And so this says, you've attacked your opponent's character or personal traits in an attempt to undermine their argument. I've got a really good current events one, okay? So who, who knows li most recently uh, about Greta Thunberg, you know, talking to the UN about climate change, okay? So if you were to say, Greta Thunberg told me we have to completely divest in fossil fuels and so on, or the planet's gonna burn up or whatever, and I said, I'm not gonna listen to a 16-year-old lecture me on fossil fuel usage. Uh, yeah. What have I just done? <laughs> That's an ad hominem. I may feel emotionally about that and I may be telling the truth and saying I'm not going to listen to a 16 year old lecture me, but I'm not dealing with her argument, am I? And so that's not a good way for me to argue. Okay, it may have rhetorical force and I, and I may, you know, show how entrenched I am, but I'm not doing anything to address the, the substance of, of her argument. Okay. And so that would be a good example, current events of, of an ad hominem attack. That yeah. was actually the example that she used. Oh yeah, all right, you rocked it. <laughs> was that the 16 year old part too? Or? No, no, I just said Trump saying something about anything. Yeah, anything, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it goes around. 
And this is probably the most, would you say this is the most common that you see, although you haven't looked at all the others, but this one is super common. Uh, and coming up with nicknames or, you know, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, Crooked Hillary or whatever, when he would use those things, or Little Ted for Ted Cruz, um, those kinds of things. But, you know, a um, lot, of, lot of sides do that, you know, so we'll see. Now let's look at the next one. So that's the ad hominem attack. You're not dealing with the person's points and their argument. You're just dealing with it. Now, here's another one that's a little, little less obvious, right? Calling somebody a name, that's pretty obvious. You're attacking them. But what if you say, uh, oh, that Williams, he's, you know, he's all for fossil fuels because he's funded by the uh, you know, petroleum industry. First of all, it's not true. I don't have any money from the petroleum industry. But what are you trying to do to my reputation? You're trying to say he doesn't have points to support his view. He's supporting his view because he's getting money from someplace else. So you're imputing my character, not my, you know, you're not saying I'm ugly. You're saying I've got ulterior motives for saying the things that I say. Again, you're not dealing with the argument. You're saying your argument is this, but your motives are that. I'm going to argue against the motives and then say I've defeated your argument on the facts. So the ad hominem isn't just an insult. It could also be uh, attacking someone's motives, attacking their associations, um, you know, so other kinds of attacks that are still against that person. You haven't dealt with their facts, you've dealt with other factors about them. Okay, so let's look at a straw man fallacy. So think, think about this. Let me go over to our, your fallacy is, uh, fallacy is um, page and find the straw man. It's pretty simple. It looks like a scarecrow. So you misrepresent someone's argument to make it easier to attack. So you're misrepresenting someone's argument to make it easier to attack. So search through your brain, different things you've seen on television or heard conversations and current events. It's important that y'all think about these, otherwise it won't stick. And so if I just keep telling you examples of these, then you won't, you won't be thinking about them. Joy, yes? Um, what would be the difference between a strong man fallacy and an ad-hominem fallacy? What would be the example that you use about someone accusing you of being a part of the story? Yes, uh, but the accusing me of having the viewpoint I have because of how I'm paid, that's an, MP, that's, a, that's an attack on the character, my character, but not my argument. You see, so, so I might say we have, uh, um, let's say my argument, I didn't actually make an argument, let's say we, we have a, a very dynamic planet and it can handle the amount of CO2 that we're putting forward. I'm not, I'm not arguing for this, but I'm saying hypothetically. This was my argument, that we have a dynamic planet and it can handle the amount of CO2 we put out with fossil fuels. Uh, that would be my argument, okay? And if you said, well, you're only saying that to protect the oil and gas industry because you get money for, from them. You're not dealing with the dynamic nature of the planet and the CO2 absorption characteristics, you see? Yeah, so that's the actual argument, is how the planet can react to CO2, not whether the fossil fuel industry grows or doesn't grow. See? So, so the argument would be the facts about the planet and about CO2. Yeah. Anybody have an example of a straw man? Yes, try. Um, when you talk about, one example I have, probably the example about Uber, how, you know, Elon Musk is like, you know, oh, Uber, it's safe driving cars, it's the new safest way to, you know, get around. Okay. But there has been incidents, you know, where like um, they they had people that got killed on the train autopilot. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. This is difficult. I'm trying to find the place in the in the attack where it's misrepresenting his view, 
right? So I'm guessing you're not the part of you like, well, you said that, you know, it was the most safest way, but what have happened to that one person that, you know? Yeah, there is one. There is a fallacy associated with that. Like he says it's safe, and you can find one example where it wasn't. Okay, so that's its own, that, we'll find that one. That's its own special fallacy. It's saying, look, it's not safe because of this one example. Okay, um, but you're still attacking his main point that they're safe. So you're still dealing with his argument that they're safe. So that wouldn't be a straw man, but that'd be like special pleading on this one case. You follow me? Yeah. You had one? Yes. Um, so I'm going to use myself as an example. Okay. So let's say I'm running for politics and I say I want to reduce the percent of student loan interest Okay. Uh, for college students. Uh, right now, let's say it's 15. Okay. I want to make that interest 10%. Okay. My opponent might say, yeah, Jeremiah wants to make college free um, and call me a socialist. Yeah, that's a great example. And I was going to use something similar to that. He didn't take your argument. He took a weak argument that college should be free, mm -hmm. right? And um, you ever hear somebody like squealing their tires down the road, you know? Um, typically high school kids, right? Just burning the rubber. I guarantee they're not paying for their own tires. <laughs> right? And so I'm kind of saying that this is the reason that's a weak argument is the idea that if it's free, it's not going to be taken seriously. Okay, so that's what makes that straw man a straw man. And also making you out to be a socialist when that's not your position. Your position is to reduce the interest and not make it free. And so, yes, I can see that that would be a straw man argument. You just wanted to reduce it a certain amount, make it more, more reasonable, and they extrapolated to an absurd condition and argued against that. Uh, you know, you might talk about different tax rates also. You know, if I'm for lowering taxes, then my opponent may say, well, you're not for collecting any taxes at all, you know. And that's, again, a, a straw man extension of my view for lower taxes or like your view for lower rates. To extrapolate that to zero then is a straw man fallacy. So that's a good example. Yeah. Okay, so let's look the next one. These are just, I'm asking you all to do about four. Um, this one is really important. And also because the name is misleading. Okay, you see the genetic fallacy. Um, this sounds like something in, related to biology, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, but it's not related to biology. So, well, they've even got over here a DNA thing on it, but it really that's misleading because it's not it's not biological. And so you judge something as either good or bad on the basis of where it comes from or from whom it came from. So you're discounting an argument just because of who's giving that argument. Do we do this? Yeah. So try to think of an example where you've done this or you've seen it done. Just because somebody's making this argument and you, want, you don't like that person or you don't like that source of information, Therefore, it's false, and you haven't dealt with the facts of the argument. And this one's one of the more difficult ones not to do yourself. You know, whether you're for, um, you know, Fox or CNN. You know, are you going to listen to anything from the news source that you don't like? Okay, that's the genetic fallacy to just discount that before you ever even look at the article. Now, I'm not saying that. Uh, Trust isn't involved, but what, what we're saying, we're, we're not talking about which one you trust. We're saying, you're, you're saying that just because it comes from that group, it's false. Okay. Before you read it. Notice how you're not dealing with the substance of the article or the argument. It's just because of where it comes from. That's the genetic part. It's, it's the really genesis or the beginning of that argument. It's coming from a group, a person, a, a place that you're prejudiced against and therefore you discount the argument before you ever hear it. That's the genetic fallacy. Okay. And then the answer to the one I remember this one is even a broken clock is right twice a day. <laughs> right? The hands don't move 
But there's a time of day when that clock's reading the correct time. Okay. Anybody have a good example? Mm -hmm. Yes, Kira. Uh, I think we do this a lot with like uh, clothes shopping. Like, oh, yeah. Going and consider like this, break, this shoe because it's not like, the brand that you want to have. Okay. But it could be like very well made. Yeah, yeah. So, like a reputation. So, yeah, reputations can feed into this. Yeah. And notice, too, there's a, the, the one that makes this confusing, at least in my mind, is there's a difference between trust and truthfulness. Okay? Yes, this, let's say we've got, to get away from the politics, but let's say we've got a news organization. You know, you can fill in the blank. I, I'm not trying to speak against any particular one, but let's say we've got one that has been caught lying over and over again. Okay? I mean, truly. Um, you may lose trust in that, and it may be valid to lose trust in that. It may be appropriate to lose trust in that. But you can't say that everything that thing puts out is false. You see what I'm saying? We're talking about the truthfulness of the argument, not about whether you trust it or not. So that's where it gets difficult. Trust versus truthfulness. Unless and these are talking about truthfulness. Yeah. Unless you win literally everything they put out. Yes, yeah. that's right. And so this is, this is a real tricky one. Um, it may be true, but I'm still got trust issues. Okay, yeah. You know, you, you borrow my car and you wreck it. Okay, and I get it repaired, and and then you want to borrow it again. Okay, you may not wreck it the second time. Okay, it may be true that you're a better driver, but I still have trust issues. You know, so so for me to argue that you will wreck it a second time, I would not be with in my rights to argue that you would, but I could argue that I've lost trust. Okay. Let's see, I think I have one more. Yeah, false cause fallacy. <laughs> this is good. Okay, so this is when you have uh, something that's correlated and you say it's causal. Okay, so causation is not, cor or correlation is not imply causation. So that's a principle we should write down. And Tyler Vegan is a guy that he made this website related to spurious correlations. We're going to look at some of the funny ones here. And it really points, it really drives this point home. Just because two things change together doesn't mean one causes the other. Okay? So they can go up together, they can go down together, they can even go in opposite directions. Like when one goes up, the other goes down. And that's correlated. It's negatively correlated, but it's still, when one goes up, the other reliably goes down. Well, it doesn't mean there's a causal connection. As much as we really want there to be, that doesn't mean there is. You actually have to show a mode of action, a way that this can cause that with successive steps, kind of like dominoes falling, for you to prove a causal relationship. Okay. So let's look at this website called tylervegan.com, Spurious Correlations. time for a new laptop. Click a link and it takes 30 seconds. Yeah, wow. Fairly recent, maybe my hard drive is getting full. Okay, here we go. Spurious Correlations, Tyler Vegan. And here's a good one. This is 99.79% correlated. I mean, a lot of times in the correlations, if we got like an 80% correlation in science, we're like, hey, that's pretty good, you know? 99.79? That is so hard to not believe that those are causally linked. 
But look at the correlation components. It's U.S. spending on space science and technology and suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. No cause, causal connection to those, you know? Are people so panicked about space spending that they start hanging themselves? <laughs> no. no, okay. If that one's not convincing, what about this one? Number of people who drown by falling into a pool and films Nicolas Cage appeared in. <laughs> and that is 66.6% correlated, but still well over 50%. So 66% correlated uh, the number of films Nicolas Cage is in and, and people who fell in a pool and died. Okay, 94% correlation of people who died by becoming tangled in their bed sheets and per capita cheese consumption. <laughs> so that's why he says these are spurious correlations. Just because they're correlated does not mean one causes the other. Okay, and he's got a thousand of these on his website. And you can generate your own. Like you can go in there, it's really a fun website. You can pick some of the craziest variables and see how they're correlated. And even has a little coffee table book that you can get just for grins if you're a statistics geek. Okay, and here's per capita consumption of margarine and the divorce rate in Maine. <laughs> and that's 99% correlated. <laughs> so that's crazy, you know. And so hopefully that drives home the point. Just because the data goes together doesn't mean one causes the other. And so this is the false cause fallacy, okay? Yeah, and so man, this, you know, I would you know, be very pleased to have some of those correlation coefficients in my calibration lines. You know, I change the concentration of my substances and the absorbance goes up or down. You know, and we're looking for 99% correlation well, there we actually have a causal relationship. We know how light interacts with matter, and the more calcium ions I have in there, and the more they're going to absorb, or whatever. And that's that we get a really nice correlation coefficient. But some of these crazy ones with 99.7, that was pretty amazing. So that's the false cause fallacy: is to say because something's correlated, one causes the other. Okay. Well, they do that with this with religion too. They they'll find oh look at the um, say test scores or something like that, some pejorative factor related to religious people, and they'll say religion causes ignorance. Okay, so they'll, they'll connect to things like that, or they'll say, um, uh, you know, science and, and scientific thinking um, is correlated with atheism, or they'll say, so thinking and being in science causes atheism. Again, that's a spurious correlation. One doesn't cause the other. And anyway, you see this sort of in the literature um, of people making those mistakes. Now, cognitive biases. So these are um, ways of thinking that are, are problematic that, you know, you've, you've heard of one like the placebo effect, okay? Because you think you're taking medicine, you get better, but there was really it's a sugar pill. And so the placebo effect Actually, taking action sometimes makes the situation better, even though there's really no, no true cause in what you did versus what, what got better. And so let's look at these. These are a, There's a whole bunch of these. Let's think about this. So confirmation bias. Let's look at that. And so for this week's writing assignment, I'm going to assign a few of these. Uh, I'll give you those two websites and you go there and you'll find, you know, like two um, biases and, and two logical fallacies that you've either committed or you're susceptible to and you just sort of self-reflect on those and it'll help you go, it'll sort of drive you into thinking about all of them. Because you'll read through them all and you'll say, okay, well this one really hits me. <laughs> okay, or this one, I do that all the time, I need to quit. Okay, so it gets you to think about those uh, those biases and also those uh, fallacious, fallacious ways to argue. So here's confirmation bias. You favor things that confirm your existing beliefs. Yeah. So, you know, put down on, their, uh, on your notes confirmation bias and the definition. You favor things that confirm your existing beliefs and, you know, Give yourself a score. Does that hit you? Again, you're not turning this into me, but you're just thinking about it right now. 
Um, do you tend to believe things that, that confirm what you already believe? Like you hear a story or read an article and, you, and they, uh, they um, present a fact that, that you kind of already believe and you're like, oh, now it's in print. I'm good. I must be right. So the text here says, we are primed to see and agree with ideas that fit our preconceptions and to ignore and dismiss information that conflicts with them. You could say this is the mother of all biases as it affects so much of our thinking through our motivated reasoning. Um, to help counteract its influence, we ought to pursue, presume ourselves wrong until proven right. So we should question our own beliefs and think about them and try to support them to ourselves. If you're trying to make an argument, the first person you need to make an argument to is yourself. It's to examine what you believe and, and to think, why do I believe that? Okay? Is it just because of the way I was raised? Is it because trusted friends told me? Is it because I have a hunch or an intuition? Those are not bad ways to come to conclusions, but they could be supported better. Okay? Um, if you have a person you trust and that person is in reality trustworthy, Okay, and what they're telling you is pretty good to base it on, uh, base your opinions on. But you still should be self-examining and make sure that you're not susceptible to confirmation bias. But we all are to some degree. This is an interesting one called the Dunning-Kruger effect. So write that one down. Dunning-Kruger. A couple of names there, hyphenated. The Dunning-Kruger effect. This one is a really interesting one. Okay. It says, the more you know, the less confident you're likely to be. The more you know, the less confident you're likely to be. It's kind of mysterious, isn't it? You would think you'd be more confident the more you know. What happens as you go through your life and you learn more and more and more? Let's discuss this one. How can this be true? Yes, Joy. Uh huh. That's fine. Yeah, that's really blowing. I was back there a while ago. <laughs> yes. Mm hmm. Yes. <laughs> That's the perfect explanation of it. Yeah, great job. And so the point is, when you first learn a subject, like she said, you learn all those spe those perfect cases, right? If I'm going to teach a freshman chemistry, I'm not going to give them the weird ones. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give them the most clean, crisp examples. And so they come out of freshman chemistry. Boy, I really know chemistry. Then they get to the junior year and they have me for PCHEM. And I was like, you know, we told you this your freshman year, but it's more complex than that, you know? And, and then they kind of walk out of class, like, what just happened? You know, that's like the, the whole foundation moved. And, and so, yes, uh, what happens, this, this less confidence, though, it's like, well, now that I know how much I don't know, or at least I see whole huge gaps in my knowledge, I'm less confident to just spout off things. And so this should make you more careful in your assertions. 
And so this also raises an alarm bell when someone's overconfident and they're hitting you with fact, 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 and there's no holes in their argument whatsoever. You're like, hmm, you know, it's almost too clean to be true, right? And you ask a few questions and hopefully they're able to answer them. But if they're not able to answer them, that's when they start getting emotional because they think for them it's perfectly clean, perfectly crisp, and there's no questions at all. There's no gray areas. There's no unknowns because it works out perfectly in their head. They only know those perfect freshman examples of a topic. Okay. And so be gentle with them. Continue to ask questions. Say, you know, it might be a little more nuanced than you think. Let's dig a little deeper together. Yeah? So wait, is the bias being overconfident or underconfident? It's actually the bias is being underconfident. Really? So you're holding back. Like you actually, this keeps you from taking advantage of your knowledge. Now you're a grad student, right? You're a PhD candidate and you know a lot about your subject, but you're reluctant to talk about it and to be confident. Uh, this can lead also to another one called uh, the imposter um, uh, syndrome, where right. you feel like you, you know, are going to be exposed as an imposter when really you know a lot about your topic. Mm -hmm. And so this one kind of is related to that one. Um, and so this is a bias against your knowledge. Yes, yeah. yeah, so it's really interesting. That's why I put it up there because I thought it was an interesting one to discuss. So look through the, the biases for this week's writing and, and you'll find some neat gems in there, things you might not have thought about. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, we got two more. Let's do the belief bias. the one here with the praying hands. Okay. And so this one, the belief bias is if a conclusion supports your existing beliefs, you'll rationalize anything that supports it. Okay. So you're starting with the conclusion and your beliefs and those match up. And so you'll make up the craziest premises to, in order to support that relationship. So I've got a conclusion, my mind's made up, it connects with my beliefs, that's unshakable. And so you'll put in three or four weakly argued premises, and if those get knocked out, you'll put three, four more up. You'll just keep shoring up these premises to keep that connection of your conclusion and your beliefs. You see how that's a bias? Nothing's ever going to shake that conclusion. This is what's so frustrating to me, like arguing with, say, a flat earther. That's the, that's the conclusion, okay? Whether I'm being trolled or not, or they really believe it, is the thing that drives me crazy, because right. you cannot determine it, right? So the belief and the conclusion they have in their head is impossible to shake, no matter what you do to the premises. And so that's, that makes my head explode, okay? Um, but you could pick any one of those, and you might be susceptible to that as well. You might have something that you believe that you're going to have that conclusion no matter what, and then you got to think, am I putting these premises in here and straining at, at, at logic as much as I am to support a conclusion that I can't question, okay? Um, so it's worth thinking about. And then let's look at the last one, that halo effect. The halo effect. So you can write that one down. And we'll go back over here. <laughs> this one is so obvious in today's culture. Oh my gosh. Um, let's see, which little picture is it though? Over here, this one, yeah. I was trying to find it. I knew it was a circle, but yeah, the little bing, little halo on top. Okay. How much you like someone or attractive they are influences your judgment of them. So you're predisposed to them because you like them, they have a great personality, or they're beautiful, then you just you trust them. You're predisposed to what they have to say. And television advertising would not work without this. You know? So a lot of these biases you find in advertisements. Again, because their goal is not truth, their goal is to sell a product. Okay? 
And so they're, they're not trying to give you, these are commercials I'm talking about, they have a goal. The goal is to get eyes on the screen and to get information across about their product. And so when they say it's the safest way to drive, you know, you don't have to drive, it's so safe, safe. You know, if that person's attractive and friendly, good personality, you're just predisposed to believe what they say, okay? And so that's how the advertisement industry works, it works so well. We do this with the celebrities, you know, they're great in a movie, I really love, man, that's such a great action film and that actor was so good in it, and then they start talking about a product and I'm predisposed to the product because the actor was great, you know, or the actress. So, so that's the halo effect, and again, it's a bias. We're just identifying our biases um, and, and hold them under a microscope. Okay, so those are just, uh, again, the lay of the land. So I was talking about reconnaissance. So that's telling you the high ground was the syllogism, the logical argument and the premises, and then some pitfalls, logical fallacies, uh, biases. And so in our conversations, we need to be aware of those kinds of things. Um, and then less, lastly, and I'll finish on time, but we um, have about four or five slides left just talking about when you get put in the hot seat or when you're in an uncomfortable situation in a conversation, what do you do? And so sometimes the best offense is a good defense. So how do you defend against someone who's really pushing you hard with an argument or a set of facts and so on? And so the person, this is one thing, this is when I say you got a good defense, the person making the claim bears the burden of proof. And if all you've done at this point is ask questions, like what do you mean by that, or how did you come to that conclusion, you haven't made any claims. And so if they make a claim and then they ask you to disprove it, that's not your job. And so this is a good defense. A lot of times they'll say something, they'll make a claim, and you'll ask a question and they realize you disagree with them. And they're like, okay, prove me wrong. And you just say, well, that's not how this works. You made the claim. What evidence do you have for believing it's true? We both want to believe true things, right? And you don't have to be snotty about it, but you can say, no, the way this works is you stated your belief, your opinion, or what have you, and I'm curious about it. I want to know how you came to that conclusion, you know? And so that's, that's again, it's a very calm defense, but you don't have to take the bait. You don't have to disprove someone else's claim, okay? And so we call this professor's ploy because professors, there's sort of this idea of the professor making a claim, a student disagrees, and then I say, oh really, Angel, you, you, you proved me wrong then, okay? And he's like, oh heck, what am I gonna do, you know? And you could probably say, no, professor, we both wanna believe true things. I'm curious about your view. How can you support it, you know? I'm the student, I don't know how to refute you, but I'm curious about your reasons for believing that, you know? And again, that would work. I'd be like, all right, he's a good guy. I'm not going <laughs> to. So um, then here's another one, a, a perfect example of sort of the professor's ploy. It happened just so. We'll take some data, and I'll tell you a story about how data point one is related to data point two. Maybe these are correlated things, and I want to make the case that they're causal. And I tell you a just so story. This is related to Rudyard Kipling, and, and his stories would end kind of like, and it happened just so. You know, like, how did the elephant get his trunk? He got into a tug, tug of war with an alligator, and it pulled his nose until it turned really long, and it happened just so. It's children's books, okay? But a lot of times, explanations of the data sound a lot like just so stories, okay? And you don't have to refute them, but you are turf totally, it's totally acceptable for you to ask questions about them, you know. And so in this case, if someone told that story, a good question was like, well, what evidence do we have of elephants before this event, of having short noses? I mean, you're not trying to refute it, you're just asking a question. You know, what, how would you support this just so story? That's a great story and it does fit all the facts well, I'll admit that. But what evidence do you have that it's true? Okay, totally legitimate question. And again, uh, a mere explanation is not an argument. It's a claim and it needs to be supported. Okay. And then sometimes uh, it helps to narrate the conversation. So when when uh, you're having a conversation and uh, the person you're talking with 
they might not be addressing your points. They might get agitated or call you names. Um, if that happens, uh, don't shut down. If you want to stay engaged, I mean, maybe you want to just say, okay, fine, you know, sorry I upset you and walk away. But I think this is another way to kind of diffuse the situation and, and ask what's going on. So you just say, you know, we were just talking about it. I asked you a question about how you came to believe something and you blew up and called me a name. You know, why? Right? And I think that that's an, that's an okay thing to ask, to say, we were just talking and now you're agitated. Did I say something or was there a, you know, a cue? What did I do to upset you? Because I was just really curious about your view. That's called narrating the conversation, right? You've stepped away from the points that you're trying to make and the questions you're trying to ask, and now you're sort of saying, here's this, equa this e conversation, and it got excitable and tense. Why? What's going on? You know, um, if I've offended you or upset you, tell me so I don't do that again. But otherwise, we can just have a talk about our views or not. We can, you know, agree to disagree and move on. But if we want to keep going with our views and understanding each other, you might narrate the conversation and, and they might say, yeah, I'm sorry I got upset. Let's go back to talking about it in a, in a calm manner. Okay. But that way you kind of keep the tensions low. And again, it's a good defensive move to just step out of a tense situation that's getting escalated and, and asking what just happened you know, and narrating com the conversation. And then lastly, let's say the person you, you're talking to has really got the facts and you're outgunned, <laughs> right? And they're hitting you with fact after fact and they're making good points and so on. This can happen and it's fine. You're going to learn a lot. And so instead of entrenching and trying to find ways to ask questions, they're hitting you with, with like a shotgun of, of information. Uh, just say, hold on for a second. Let me take some notes. You know, you raise some good points. Let me think about them. When you say, let me think about them, there's nothing expected more of you right then. You don't have to defend your turf. You don't have to make counterclaims. You can just say, hey, tell me more. You're beating up on my view. Beat me up slowly, one punch at a time, so I can take good notes and understand, you know, your facts. But I, I'm going to go look them up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about them. And maybe we can meet sometime in the future and, and I might have some more questions. Okay, so I think it's a great way. You don't have to lose face. Again, you're saying, hey, you made some good points. Let me think about your points. Okay, totally legitimate. And then lastly, this is, we'll end with a quote from Greg Kokel. Um, this is just the reality. There's nothing you can do about it. But good arguments that are sound, appropriate, and consistent with what's true do not persuade people who don't care about those things. And so there may be situations where you just, it's just an impasse and you need to walk away like Peter Boghossian said. He's like, you've gone too far, you're, you're in emotional land now, and you're not really gonna cover any ground, but you can still be friends, you can still get coffee, you can still keep it light and make a personal connection. Okay, and that's important. We don't, and there's never an excuse to be rude in this world. There's never. And so you can still be nice to people and in, in not agree with their worldview, okay? And not try to make them agree with your worldview, okay? Uh, when the time arises and they make some statements, you can come back to the questioning again. But again, if, if you're trying to persuade them of something and it just isn't going anywhere, don't push it. You know. All right, so we'll see you next time. <laughs>